The story begins with a bunch of people summoned to another world while on their way to school. The king explained that for the past few years their human nation had warred against the demon nations, incurring heavy losses and debt as a result. They were on the verge of an extreme crisis which is why they decided to summon people from other worlds, blessed with power, to their aid. Then he announced them as the great heroes. They didn't seem to understand his words. They started to measure their abilities. A black-haired girl had the scythe of the goddess skill which was pretty rare. When they checked the other skills they realized that all of them had some special skills. The black-haired girl didn't seem to understand what a skill was. A man explained that it was something that a person gains when passing to their world. The king considered those as the gods' favor. The boys seemed to like the idea of being heroes. The king was also happy that they had some good skills, and it was quite worthwhile to summon them in that word. One of the men stated that the boy named Itonami Norio had no skills. Itonami Norio was a useless corporate drone and had a quite boring life. Before he summoned the other world, he bumped into a chubby man on the train. The man introduced himself as a god and explained that he was about to be summoned to another world since his daddy picked him out. According to him, his daddy was the king of gods, Zeus. He mentioned the until now the administrator was Athena and she was making some discriminations against men. His name was Hephaestus and he was good at making things. It was his first time giving a skill to someone so he gave his best preparing it. The skill he gave to him was the master of supremacy. It was hard to use but he would figure it out. He put the skill spare on his chest and completed the skill giving process. Back to the king's mansion there was a clamor between the guardians. Itonami was sure about his non-existent ability to fight with demons. He wanted to ask him something but the king was worrying about how he could never go back to his world. They had a way to summon heroes into their world but they had no way of sending them back. Others were in shock and thought they were joking around. The king mentioned that only the head of the demon king knows how to do that which was exactly why they would go and fight his armies. However, as Itonami had no skills he could not do that. He then offered to have a plot of land. He didn't mind the location and just wanted to use the land and live out his life in solitude. Since he couldn't live his life the way he wanted to, he decided to live out his second life. One of the king's men brought him somewhere and explained that he was free to live there however he chose. The area wasn't part of the kingdom but that means he should choose to live, farm and harvest crops there and wouldn't have to pay them anything. The man got his guide fee and told him to live as he wanted regardless of whether he lived or died. He felt a little bad for making them pay for him. After the man left he looked to the land he owned and his new life began. Normally someone would group up with others and go on a great adventure but he would rather live without action so he would enjoy a life in safety in that new world. He would rather not have them implore him anyway. He arrived at the beach and decided to make that place his own little kingdom. But to do that he had to secure some water. To secure that he needed to check if it was seawater or drinkable water. It was surprisingly fresh drinkable water. Then he noticed an octopus in the sea. Even though he wondered if it lived in shallow water, decided to get food one way or another. When he got into the sea he realized that the water was so salty even though it was so sweet earlier. He took some water in his palm and drank it. The water was sweet when he drank it using his hands but was salty when he drank directly. It didn't seem like water would be a problem so he decided to eat the octopus he hunted. He didn't have any seasoning either so he decided to cook it with some salt water boiled octopus. Firstly he needed to start the fire and he carve a hole into a dry wood and then make a notch. He put a stick into the hole and rotated it by hand, then moved the embers created by friction onto a dry leaf. It was easy to say and hard to manage so took a deep breath and started to spin the stick with determination. The moment he spun the fire lit up. While he was eating his octopus he felt something odd about that world because the fire lit up so easily and he even made a bowl and chopsticks. While he was thinking about how his survival skills were so great, he realized that surviving could be the skill that God gave him. He decided to test it out and swung his sickle and it worked. The grass is cut all the way to the stem. He then tried plowing and it was indeed plowed, and so thoroughly that he doesn't even have to do anything. Also it was the exact size he imagined to have a crop field. The master of supremacy took the efficiency of anything he was holding and multiplied it. With that power starting a farm would be easy. He started to plant the seeds when he got back in town and was done in a few minutes. He didn't really know what was planted but if he could harvest it then he wouldn't have to worry about food supplies. But even so, it would take a while until it grew. He decided to fish something for the dinner. While fishing he was thinking about the life he had before and now. He decided to sacrifice some rice balls for Mr. Hephaestos for giving him such a great skill. A fish came on his hook and he thought it was a big one because it was pretty hard to control. When he finally managed to pull the rod up, he saw that he was holding a mermaid instead of a fish. He couldn't believe he fished up a girl then realized that it wasn't a girl it was a mermaid. The mermaid girl scolded him for fishing her. Before he could say anything the mermaid stated that since she got fished by him he had to marry her. 
While thinking that, the distance suddenly dropped to zero. He was shocked that he got a mermaid wife in another world. The mermaid was complaining about her situation while he was thinking about how different she looked from the book's illustration. She stated that she couldn't return to the ocean anymore but he thought she was exaggerating. The mermaid got even angrier and told him that she had no choice but to become his spouse. She ordered him to take some responsibility and provide for her. He tried to make some excuses and told her to think that through a little. She agreed with him saying that with her tail they wouldn't be able to mate. She took out a bottle and drank it. Her tail disappeared and her leg came out but she was fully naked. She was relieved that she could live on land like that without having any problem with giving birth to his children. Itanami panicked and told her to put some clothes on. In the heat of the moment, he took her as his wife, but he didn't have anything besides the field he lowed earlier. Meanwhile, she was uncomfortable with wearing clothes, but he strictly stated that he wouldn't marry her if she didn't put those pants on. He promised to get her some clothes she liked when he could. What was more important now was that they currently don't have a roof to sleep under. He looked at the field and the seeds were sprouting already which made him surprised. She asked what he was growing but he didn't know it either. He was planning to start being self-sufficient with those and make his tools, food, and house by himself and live a humble life. It was different from the life of a mermaid, but if that is what he wanted she was understanding. Apparently medicinal magic was her species ancestral magic and she was actually a famous magic user in that respect. He didn't seem to believe her so she told him that she would show him if he didn't get it with a weird accent. She told him to wait and went back to the sea to get her things from home. When she left, Itonami decided to build a simple house. In one hour, he made a shack. He got tired and went inside to rest. He fell asleep while thinking about the mermaid and was sure she wouldn't come back. She woke him up and he told her to put some clothes on again. He asked where was she all night and stated that he was really worried. The mermaid told him that there was no need to be worried. While they got out of the house, she explained that it took her a while to pack up her tools for medicinal magic. She explained that if he combined medicinal plants or similar things with magic, he would obtain medicinal magic. There were several applications for the various solutions he could devise, and because ordinary people could utilize them as well, they were highly valuable. She wasn't done showing him stuff, she brought a huge fish and it was a Ba Herring G, which is a fish-type monster that had a lot of mana stored inside its body. She cut, boiled, extracted, and powdered the fish, and created a product named Ba Herring G Fertilizer. If he spread that on his field, his plants would grow faster. Itonami was surprised that she was doing all that for the field. The following day, the crops were all grown and he accepted that Ba Herring G was amazing, but she claimed that the amazing one was actually her. He ignored her and tasted a tomato, and it was delicious. The mermaid also tried it, and it was so tasty. She was astounded that the land dwellers ate such delicious foods all the time. She was going to eat some green onions when he stopped her and explained that vegetables had unique qualities and that some of them were inedible before they were cooked. He made a boiling mishmash since she insisted on eating. He served it to her, and when she tasted it, she loved it. He looked at her happy face while eating and he thought he could live with her. She was still in denial that people were actually eating that on a regular basis. He mentioned that it should be more meaty so she would combine it with meat or add some fermented herbs as condiments. She was shocked that it could get even more delicious. While he was making plans the mermaid was thinking how good he was. He then asked her name and her name was Plotty. Itanami was about to tell her his real name but he decided to change it and said that his name was Kidan and stated that he was looking forward to living with her. He started his new life as Kidan in another world with a mermaid. The next morning Kidan woke up and noticed that Platy wasn't in her bed. He wondered if she was comfortable sleeping on the bed and hoped that she wasn't struggling. He heard a scream and it was Platy shouting that there was someone in the field, but it was actually the scarecrow with a wooden sword. He explained that scarecrows drive away birds that would ruin the crops. By having it there, the birds would think it was a human and wouldn't come close to the crops. Suddenly the scarecrow started to move which was usually impossible. He figured that it was because of his skill. Platy asked if something was wrong with his hands but he explained that he was summoned there by the king of that country and he was another worlder. While he was explaining his skills, Platy realized that he was a hero. Kidan was surprised that she knew it. She thought those heroes who summoned from other worlds were using their power to fight with demon kind and asked what he was doing there. He explained that he didn't like to kill demons so he basically retired to that place. That was pretty surprising to Platy because land dwellers and humans usually stick together to survive and if they don't, they would be killed by monsters. She wondered how he was different from them but he said he was the same race as the one she was speaking of. He then started to think about what to do for breakfast and remembered that she woke up early today. He asked if she was okay and where did she go. Unexpectedly her face turned red and told him that she had gone to the toilet. She then asked him where did he do it. He said that he was doing in the ocean which made her pissed off. He tried to defend himself by saying they were doing that while sailing so the plankton fed on that, then were eaten and made the food chain. 
She told him that there was no such thing and that she hated exactly that insensitive side about humans. The ocean's food cycle was completed by the ocean's inhabitants. She required him to not impose his older world's dirty ways on her. He begged at her feet and apologized. She suddenly started to run away from him. He didn't understand what she was doing but didn't insist on her to come back. He thought about the toilet situation and realized that he may seem to have forgotten the basics of survival. A part of him was relieved that Platy was there with him. However, he wondered how she felt about that. Platy came back from wherever she was and brought him a starfish-shaped monster. The prideful starfish stay underwater and absorb organic matter around them, and they were the ocean's cleaners. If he put them in something like a box, he would have his toilet. She cut her wrist just to show how it works, which made him worried. He felt guilty because of what was happening to her. She blushed for a moment but then she showed him that her wrist was fine. He was amazed by her. He apologized for being so scared, inconsiderate, and dirty. The reason he fished her was also due to the power he had received, and told her to go back to the ocean if she wanted. But she refused and told him that she liked him which is why she was going to support him as his wife. Kidan got shy and thanked her. She stated that even though their life became easier, he still had to make her breakfast. Meanwhile, in a dungeon, there was a demon sensing his strange mana close by. In the next scene, Platy is showing her skirt she made from the wrapping cloth she brought in her luggage. He felt sorry for not being resourceful enough. She didn't mind that because a wife made herself presentable for her husband's sake. Besides, she was going out for the first time in a while. He wondered where she was going and she said that she found a dungeon. A dungeon was somewhere you could venture underground and find treasure, fight with monsters, and there was a boss waiting at the bottom layer. It would be easier if he saw it himself so she took him to the dungeon. The dungeon was two hours away. She stated that she found it while he was working in the field. It was a cave-type dungeon. Apparently, dungeons appear where it is abundant in mana. It looked like a normal cave to him but when he took a step forward he felt an enormous power. He felt like a large animal was licking his face. Depending on the place, the energy that flows and circulate around the world would stop its flow and stagnate. Those places become dungeons and would become increasingly dense inside the dungeon eventually. It would condense and be reincarnated into monsters. As a result, the monsters born within the dungeons would eventually overflow and invade the earth and its oceans. Kidan was surprised by her words. She mentioned that cleansing the things inside was next to impossible so they would periodically come back and beat up monsters. Before he could object, she went into the dungeon and as her husband, he decided to go with her. Inside the dungeon, it was completely different from the entrance. The interior was like a castle. Platy felt something strange and noticed that they were already there. A bunch of different monsters started to run towards them. She told him to stay back and took out a few little tubes. She threw them the tubes and created an explosion. Kidan was already amazed but it wasn't over. She froze them and struck them with lightning. Lastly, she literally melted them. All of those were thanks to her ability to make battle medicine. She kept walking while he was thinking about how he couldn't choose which one was the monster. He let her handle things there. Besides, he felt like he was useless if he couldn't get a hold of a weapon to use against them. He looked around and found a sword but it didn't look like he would get the chance to use it. He said that she beat quite a few of them so he wanted to go home but she refused. There was something weird about that dungeon she was feeling. The layout of the dungeon and the feeling that those monsters were being led by something means that there was a master there. Dungeons with a master were extremely rare and they were also extremely dangerous. When he heard that, he looked worried. There were only two species that could even become dungeon masters in the first place which could be a dragon or something else but before she could say what it was, they got a weird feeling that Kadan felt at the entrance of the dungeon. The ghostly air proved that there was a dungeon master there which was the worst of the two. A king of the undead, Lifeless King. Lifeless King was a powerful and intelligent magician or high priest who decided to turn themselves into an undead during his past life. The immortal monarch that reigns over the undead and encounters him was meant to encounter death. The lifeless king was feeling that special mana and wanted to turn him into a corpse and welcome him as his companion. She threw some of her potions but it healed itself. She told him to run and leave that to her since she had some potions but he could never do such a thing like that. He swung his sword and started to run towards the king while saying he was her husband. Platy was about to tell him to stop, but the king yielded immediately, leaving them in shock. The lifeless king said that although he used the holy sword to strike him, his power was still frightening. He got so happy that he picked up a holy sword. The king realized that the sword was the one he owned, but that sword was now his, because holy swords have wills of their own and they choose their own masters. And he was the chosen one. And as he lost the holy sword, his duty in that world was over. He informed him that he could strike him down with that sword now. Kidan felt bad and stated that he was probably not the owner of that sword. He explained that he came from another world, and before that, he was given the power to become a master of any tool he held. 
that power probably reacted with the sword since he was using it. While he was explaining the king cut his words and couldn't believe him. That was a gift from the gods that was only heard of in legend. That kind of a skill immeasurable within the calculations of a skill which was probably why the guardian couldn't see any skill. Someone who has received a skill from a god shouldn't even consider it a hero. And the king told him that he was a saint. He prostrated him and asked him to allow him to offer him the greatest form of hospitality. Meanwhile, Platy was feeling proud of her husband that she set her eyes upon. The king then asked what brought him to such a place and he explained that he actually settled down in the area. Platy mentioned that exterminating monsters was the most important thing for someone living there. Monster fur and bones made for great magic tool materials. He couldn't believe the dungeons of that world were actually convenience stories. She then asked if it would be okay to go wild around every once in a while and the king was okay with it. He was actually cleaning some of the excess monsters himself so they would be helping him. Suddenly she seemed to like the king as she called him their neighbor. They introduced themselves and the king had a hard time remembering his name. In his past life, he served as the archbishop of a certain church. And it seemed that for some reason he ended up being pursued and was on the run. He delved into that dungeon and absorbed the stagnating man, where he turned into an undead by placing a great curse upon himself. He seemed to forget the reason why he became an undead in his name. Platy and Kadan felt bad for him, but from now on it would seem his suffering that was boredom would wane, even if only a little bit. Kidan smiled and told him to come visit them sometime. He mentioned that they would welcome him with some of the vegetables they were growing and called him Master. He explained that since the lifeless king was a high-ranking member of a church during his life, he would be calling him Master from now on. Master thanked him with tears in his eyes. And this is how they found themselves a nice neighbor and obtained the Holy Sword. In the next scene, Kidan finished making a smithing kiln. The Holy Sword was amazing because it could cut a boulder like it was warm butter. She wondered why he made a smithing kiln. He reminded her of the mana metal right present he received from the lifeless king. She found the king very big-hearted. There was rarely enough dense mana in cave dungeons for it to materialize into a single piece of mana metal, and giving it away like that was a big kindness. When she asked what he was going to do with it, he said that he could make what he had been wanting to make. She thought he was about to make a sword or something, but he made a pan and a kitchen knife. He thought it would be faster if he demonstrated it. He cut the vegetables with the kitchen knife and then fried them with the frying pan. He added flavor using salt and pepper. He finished making the fried vegetables and Platy seemed to love it. He also made some utensils. The mana steel was a good heat conductor and it was very light and the burnt food didn't stick on it so it was easy to clean. He got so happy that his cooking repertoire expanded. Platy asked if he had other new dishes he wanted to add and he approved her. She asked what he needed and the meat was his priority right now. The meat would be amazing with vegetables with some oil. After hearing his words, she decided to stroll in the forest. She mentioned that due to her being a mermaid, she still hasn't seen a mountain-type monster until now and she had always wanted to eat one. Since he looked confused, she explained that there were a lot of types of monsters like bird types and mountain types of monsters which were deer and boars. The most cooking-suited ones were mountain types so that is why they were in the forest. Kidan mentioned that the monsters were born in the cave dungeon but the lifeless king was using his powers to control the monsters from going out which could mean the mountain itself was the dungeon. However, he didn't believe that there was a dungeon near there so he was comfortable. Ironically, a bunch of square boars appeared and they were definitely ready to fight them. Unlike Kidan, Platy was happy that there were two dungeons nearby. He told her to focus on beating every single one down. She told him to restrain them as cleanly as possible and not be picky with her bringing them down naturally. The boars started to attack him so he had no choice but to use his sword and he managed to kill them all. She was praising him but he did it because they had been coming one after another and he unexpectedly defeated them. She changed the subject and suggested to start preparing it. She promised to use her potion to freeze the meat and preserve it if he cut it to a size that is easy to cook. After a while they finished cutting and freezing the meats and he was amazed by her. Thanks to her their daily life would started to improve. She was waiting for him to make something delicious and he was planning to make tonkatsu. His mouth watered while thinking about tonkatsu but there was something missing which was the egg. He asked if there was a custom in that world where they cook bird eggs. As much as she knew there wasn't but she did hear that the land dwellers of that country do that kind of thing but he can't see that kind of thing in the mermaid country. She suggested going to the mountains again one more time and if they searched, they could possibly find a bird type monster. If they happened to come across a monster again they would have to kill it too. Suddenly he sensed a strong presence and they couldn't understand what that thing was in the air. When it landed, they realized that it was a dragon. The dragon asked if they were the ones who invaded the dungeon he was ruling. Kidan was still in shock, and Platy pointed to the mountain asking if it was there. The dragon approved her, and she asked if he was the master of that dungeon, and he approved that as well. The dragon's name was Grinzel Dragonvale, and he asked who entered his dungeon king mountain without asking, 
and slaughtered his underlings. Kidan tried to explain that they didn't know that there was a monster of that mountain. He apologized and promised to never go there again. However, it was unforgivable for Grinzel, and he was so dedicated that he would erase his entire existence. The dragon started to attack by shooting flames from its mouth. Platy was in a panic shouting they were going to die but he would not let that happen, so he swung his sword toward the flames and blocked it. The dragon was taken aback by that because a mere human could never do something like that. Meanwhile Platy was so proud of her husband. The dragon was still shocked that nothing was harmed by its flames. They looked at each other and Kidan apologized for entering its dungeon without permission, but if he really wanted to pursue matters beyond that, he would fight with him. He asked if the master of the dungeon was willing to fight with death with him while he was praying that it would back off. The dragon didn't say anything but saw his sword. He had an idea to use the sword's name to make himself look stronger than he was. However, the dragon told him that the sword was his and tried to take that from him. Before it could take away the sword, Lifeless King appeared and stopped it. He punched the dragon and apologized for everything. They didn't seem to understand what happened so he explained that the dragon came to his dungeon to find the ones who entered his dungeon, and he accidentally told it about him. Kadan told him that it was their fault to barge into the dragon's mountain without permission. He explained that for a monster of the dungeon, invaders were just an everyday occurrence which means getting angry just because the shallow part of your dungeon was invaded, and leaving the dungeon to chase down the invader was too imprudent. He kept scolding the dragon for a while and told him to go back to its mountain, but the dragon refused to leave there because he wanted to have the sword that its father asked it to retrieve from that dead body. He asked why the lifeless king gave the sword to him, and he explained that the sword had its own will and chose Kidan over there. The debate flared up and they were about to fight with each other. Kidan told them to wait and hold on to the dragon's tail and it fell like it was nothing. The dragon was trying to understand how he managed to do that, but instead Kidan asked him if he would like to join them for a meal. He then brought a newly cooked steak, and when it ate it he was enchanted. While the dragon and Platy were begging him to give more, the dragon started to shine and shrinking. The dragon then turned into a girl. Lifeless King explained that the dragons do have those kinds of abilities. The dragon girl explained that she come to like the steak he made and would always loke her. After they ate, the dragon which her name was Gritzel told him to not get carried away just because he could cook a bit. She also stated that she would burn that man inside into ashes with the cum in her bad. She turned to a dragon again and promised to took the sword back from him and eat delicious meat. He told him that he was welcome anytime. Before it left, she asked if there were any bird monsters in his mountain. He didn't know how many but they were bony so they don't waste good. She asked if he had some eggs and they have eggs. It seemed he could make the meat dish even more tasty than today. After hearing that the dragon went straight to the dungeon to catch the birds. She stooped it and told him to took her too since she knew about monsters' ecology. They were gone and he smiled at the sky thinking how lively his life was. In the next scene, Kadan makes a sword out of monometal. The sword would be the world's strongest sword if he excluded the holy sword. She asked if he was going to sell it but he had planned to upgrade Kakashi which was his scarecrow. Platy thought Kakashi would chop the pesky birds aiming their fields and told him to use it. While Kakashi was trying to kill the birds, Kadan yelled that killing was prohibited, but it didn't really seem possible anyway. She asked why he gave the sword to him and he explained that it was because it was awesome. She did not seem to understand his type of romance. It had been a while since Kadan went fishing. The last time he went fishing he caught a mermaid and he got married. As a salaryman like him he was sent to a different world and he thought he would fully enjoy his slow life there. But his life became fulfilled, thanks to the mermaid who forced him to become her husband, lifeless king, and the dragon veil. Being able to have a moment of peace away from that liveliness was relaxing to him. While he was thinking that, a head appeared on the surface of the ocean. A man with the same ears as Platy asked him if he was friends with Platy and before he could answer, he ordered his soldiers to kill him and everyone who opposes. Everyone started to throw their spares at him. He immediately grabbed his sword, made a counterattack, and defeated the soldiers. While thinking about what to do, Platy came and what was happening. The man who tried to kill Kadan was Platy's brother. The soldiers asked her if she was okay and called her princess, which made Kadan confused. She decided to introduce herself properly and explained that that man was her older brother, Prince Arowana, and he was the next heir to the throne. She then introduced Kadan as her husband. Everyone was shocked. She understood that he came there to bring her back but she stated that she would never go back to the mermaid kingdom. Prince Arowana didn't seem to accept her decision and told his soldiers to resume the battle to kill the land dweller Kidan for violating his sister and kidnapping her. He was dedicated to killing him and bringing back Platy. She told Kidan to not hesitate to counterattack but there was no way he could dare to do that. The dragon came to help and the soldiers wanted to run away in panic and fear. The dragon asked if Kidan was alright and the prince was too stunned to speak. Platy told Dragon to not get too excited just because he was thanked. 
The prince was still having a hard time processing what was happening and didn't even notice that he was the only one who didn't leave there. As a reward for not running away from the dragon, Gazar told him that he would turn him into charcoal. The prince wasn't scared of someone like him and refused to listen to anything he said. Plady agreed and told him that since there was nothing to talk about, he should return to his kingdom. Kidan interrupted and told her that she couldn't talk like that because the reason her brother was there was because he was worried about her. As for him, it was his responsibility to listen to what he had to say. The prince thought about it for a second and changed his mind. Kidan led him the way and the dragon hoped that he would treat him to a new meal. Plady seemed confused about something. When they returned home, the prince reprimanded Kidan for allowing his sister to reside in such a rundown house. Kidan felt ashamed. As he began to imagine various scenarios in his mind, Plady advised her brother to turn his attention to the other side, where they kept the meat and vegetables from the mountains in a storage building. It was the prince's first encounter with a plaster wall, which left him astonished. But that wasn't all. There was also a factory where they produced seasonings, and they had to wait for the miso and soy sauce to be ready. The prince found himself perplexed by the unfamiliar terminology. Plady bragged about her husband about how skillful he could do anything perfectly. Even the storehouse served as her magic compounding room too, and he was also treating her well. Kidan offered him a seat to eat the new dish he made. He mentioned that recently he made a garden table to drink some tea and eat. The prince noticed the little girl and asked where she came from. He explained that she was Grinzel Dragon Vale's human form. He then served everyone a plate of Zenzai which was made from azuki beans. The prince and the others tasted it and were amazed by the taste. Grinzel asked for the second but since he grew it accidentally he could only make a small amount of them. Plady and Grinzel glared at the prince because if he wasn't there they would have eaten more. The prince then prostrated himself and apologized for underestimating his abilities and stated that he was considering him as a saint or a sage. The prince was now convinced that his sister was in love with him and wanted to leave his sister to him. Plady was excited but he asked the prince if he was sure that was okay. That was his first time hearing that she was a princess and had responsibility, and she can't just give up on everything and marry him. After all, a lot of people's expectations were involved in that, he thought, but she denied that. She didn't care about people's expectations as long as she was married to him. While she was screaming, the prince told her to calm down. It seemed to him that Kidan didn't know Platy's circumstances. If it was a marriage, Platy faces a problem she cannot avoid. Vale seemed like she already knew the situation. There was a conflict over the sovereignty of the surface between humans and demonic beings, and it had now reached the mermaids who were neutral about that issue so political marriage was imposed. The prince asked how she knew that, but as long as that continued for a hundred years, it would still get on her ears whether she liked it or not. Kadan now understood the situation. The prince approved Vale and mentioned that engagements from both humans and magical beings were coming, and the royals were forced to choose a side. Kadan asked what happens if they don't want to choose either side. If they don't, they will become enemies of both sides and they will be targeted by their attacks. That is why the highest echelons of the kingdom were discussing which race Plady should marry. Her brother understood that she wanted to solve the problem and save the kingdom by disappearing. And now she was living with Kidan without any disturbance so he wanted to fulfill his sister's wish. He turned to Plady and stated that he was glad that she met such a nice person like him. He begged for one more time to protect her and marry her officially. If that was the case, Kidan wouldn't mind marrying her officially. Vale interrupted and confirmed that he was going to marry her. Unexpectedly, she decided to marry him too. She was thinking about how to get that holy sword he possessed, and the properties that would be shared if he get married. And the lifespan of humans was like a blink of an eye for dragon. She was also thinking about the delicious meals she would eat. She then asked if he would marry her, and he refused immediately. She didn't seem like she was expecting him to refuse, so she asked why. And he explained that he already have Platy. She tried to convince him by saying it was totally fine for a strong man like him to have multiple females. Even though he was strong, he wasn't interested in polygamy and he wasn't even Vale's master. She started crying which was the last thing he could expect. It. He wanted to stop her from crying and screaming that she wasn't as strong as the undead king, and he hated her so he accepted her proposal. While she was celebrating, he apologized to the prince for doing that in front of him, but the prince knew that fathers who had daughters worldwide had that kind of thing in common. Meanwhile, Plady didn't seem to like the idea of another woman. Plady's brother left to report to his father and mother. If they could get their approval, they would be officially married. She seemed to have doubts about the marriage. She confessed that she ran away from home and because she was caught she was forced to be his bride but she had fun and loved his cooking. She stated that she wanted to be with him forever, but thought she was just bothering him. Kidan seemed to be surprised by her words. Knowing her circumstances, he didn't intend to change how they live their lives right now. He received a skill from a god but they noticed that he was useless in fights, so he came there. And there was no way that he was a strong human but with that they could aim for a happy life 
which is why, from that day, he wanted her to stay by his side, which made her thrilled. She was hugging him when Vale came and stated that she was hungry. He decided to treat them as a wedding gift. In the next scene, Kidan decides that they need more help from other people. Right now, he wanted to do something about the field and he wanted to manage and harvest the crops that were already matured. Ever since he also started making miso and soy sauce, his hands had been full. As a married man, he wanted to build a home. Then Lifeless King appeared and supported his decision but he got scared because he didn't even realize he was there. He asked if there was something wrong but he just had some free time so he came to hang out. Then he showed him the mana metal souvenir. He was very happy that he bought a big one which would be a great help. With that, he now could make tons of house tools. That was perfect for someone like him who was short-handed. The thing was the other day Platy's brother pointed out a few things. He wanted to build something different from anything he had ever done until now, which was why he was building a home. Platy suggested asking Lifeless King for help. He didn't think it would be a good idea but the king asked how many people he needed and if 10 would be enough, before he could ask how he was going to get them there. He told them to wait for a moment and transformed. When he came back he brought a bunch of humanoid monsters from his dungeon. There were five orcs and five goblins. The monsters who were born in his dungeon took orders from him. He gave them orders to obey the holy saint so he could tell them whatever was needed. He introduced himself but the monsters stared at him without any emotion. The lifeless king explained that they don't have the ability to speak. They had enough intelligence to comprehend orders but they lacked self-aware. He mentioned that he also didn't need to give them rewards. On top of that, they absorb mana in the air to sustain themselves so he didn't need to feed them. Platy seemed impressed. He thanked the king for his nice gesture. The king wished him good luck in making his house transformed again. He said everyone to combine their strengths and build a splendid house with a big enthusiasm but again, there was no emotion on the monster's face. They worked together with a great combination and Kidan seemed to be impressed by their productivity. The orc physique was really suited for manual labor while goblins were skillful with their hands because they were small. They were having a hard time learning hard jobs but if he taught them diligently, they steadily got better. There was nothing special in getting help but watching them working for him made him become nicer and nicer to them. Platy was watching and listening to him with admiration. She suggested he not empathize with them too much since they weren't living creatures. She was right but for Kidan everyone should be given a chance to live like that. She explained that magical beings have employed humanoid monsters on a large scale to fight against humans. These monsters are sent in armies and their strategy is based on the assumption that they will ultimately be defeated. However, even if they are killed, they can always be replaced in the dungeon. He was surprised by what he heard but even though what she said was true, monsters were the ones who helped them in so many ways. He tried to accept the world he was living in now. A goblin lost its balance and fell to the ground. He immediately went to check if it was okay, or if he had hurt, but then remembered that they couldn't talk. Suddenly the goblin mumbled that he was alright. Platy and Kadan were scared and shocked at the same time. When he asked again if he was alright, the goblin approved him again. He tried to say that he wanted to work more for Kidan and another goblin joined him. Others also started to speak and told him that they wanted to work. It seemed the monsters now had self-awareness but he did not believe that self-awareness was something that could happen simply like that. That was probably from the power he received, he thought. He reminded himself to use his hands with caution because it was too amazing. However, with his skill, he would finally be able to talk to them. He embraced the goblins with a little tears in his eyes. Platy knew that they couldn't just use them and abandon them at the end. After a while the house was completed. Vale was shocked when she was in the house because she wasn't there to watch the house built from nothing. She wanted to go and explore the house but Kidan stopped her and told her to take off her shoes at the entrance. She seemed to love the house and looked like she was going to stay, which was why he made a big house. Platy asked him if he had made the house big enough to let the monsters stay. That was his plan but when they refused his offer, he suggested they make a tenement house near there where they could stay. He also asked for their help to make the kitchen and the bathroom which they eagerly accepted. A goblin whom he named Gobukichi informed him that the thing he requested was ready and he showed her the futon he made. He stated that this was his present to Platy. He grew cotton side with the grass to make tatami and all because he really wanted to have a futon in their new house. When she got to the futon she was shocked that it felt that good. He apologized for making her sleep on plywood until now. She thanked him with shiny eyes and she also thanked Gobukichi. Later on, Platy's brother comes to visit them and Kidan offers tea. He commented that building a house like that in a short time must be the gift of a god. The reason he came there was about his and Platy's marriage. He had consulted his father and at first he was confused, but when he told him about Kadan's personality and strength, his father agreed to it. It was a good thing that he didn't belong to any race even though he was so strong. Kadan mentioned how stressed Platy was because of the political marriage, 
and asked about the humans and other magical beings. The prince said they were angry but his father, the Mermaid King, proclaimed that. He convinced his father that Kidan was a holy saint which is why he agreed on the marriage. Once again there was resentment when they lost Platy but considering that hostile forces were also aiming for Platy, it seemed that it was better to leave it. The prince prostrated again and promised him that they would do their best to not cause him any trouble and begged him to take care of Platy. He told him to stop that and explained that he enjoyed being with Platy, which he was thankful for it. He arrived there alone and if it wasn't for Platy, he would still be alone. He might even forget his own name like the lifeless king. The prince was confused that he was a neighbor with an undead king. Suddenly one of the goblins came and informed him that an enemy attacked from the coast, and a large number of monsters that were magical beings landed. Right now the orcs and goblins were fighting them. The prince couldn't believe the place was discovered by the magical beings even though it was their country's top secret area. They went outside and confirmed that the ship was the magical being's ship. One of the orcs named Orkubo got their demon lord. She was Astra's of Deception, one of the four heavenly kings. The orc explained that she came to kill Kidan so they captured her. Kidan noticed the pile of bones there and the goblin explained that they were skeleton soldiers led by magical beings. There were about a hundred bodies but they all defeated them which made him shocked. He started to give them a lecture about how dangerous it was to do something like that and worried that he could lose them. Meanwhile the demon lord got annoyed that he was ignoring her. The prince asked her how she knew that place but she ignored his question and started to insult mermaids. She told him to not underestimate their intel gathering network and even if it took forever, they wouldn't understand. She then freed herself and explained that her task was to bring back the mermaid princess and kill the bride thief, the holy saint. The goblins informed Kidan that she supervises the demon lord's upper echelons and she was thirsty for blood. On the battlefield, she was a monster who made even her allies tremble in fear. The prince didn't care about any of that and tried to attack her but he stopped her. The lifeless king appeared and stated that they were too noisy. The prince was speechless when he introduced the dead king as his neighbor. Then, he was even more surprised when Vale came in her dragon form and asked what was happening. Not only the prince, the demon lord was also surprised that he was welcoming a dragon. Platy came and asked him if he was okay. The prince asked where she had been and Vale explained that they were searching for eggs on the mountain and for tonkatsu. Then, they saw the demon ship on the ocean and got curious. Vale was furious that she, as a lowly demon, came there to kill her master. Hurting her master means having her as her enemy too so he threatened to destroy their entire race. Kidan warned her to not speak too boldly. Astra seemed to be scared a lot so he offered her to promise that they wouldn't be hostile to them and they would let her go home. She was too proud to accept that offer and told him to stop insulting her even though her voice was trembling in fear. She tried to pull herself together and stood up. She had a proposal to have a duel with her one on one and if she lose she would consider his offer. Vale got angry but he stopped her. Kidan's main goal in that world was to protect his lifestyle so he accepted her offer and took off his sword. Astras was confident because even though he had strong allies, he was still a human. However when she noticed that he was holding the legendary evil sword Drishwartz, she dropped her sword and fainted. Vale wanted to bury her like that and let her become fertilizer but he wouldn't let that of course. Kidan wanted Vale to take her to her home because the sailors were so shocked to see Vale that they ditched Astras and retreated. She accepted unwillingly, and while on their way to Astra's home she asked why she was serving Kidan, but she didn't say anything to her, even though the real reason was to eat his delicious food. After a while, Astras came there with her allies and stated that she had something to talk to him about. Platy got annoyed and yelled at her to go home. Kidan tried to calm Platy and the girls behind Astras explained that they had been expelled from the Demon King's army. Astras corrected that she was the only one who chased out of the army and they could go back to the army but the girls seemed quite loyal to her. Vale couldn't listen to them anymore and threw thunder but he told her to stop or he would cut her meals which made him transform her human form. He felt sorry that she was expelled from the army. She explained that she failed her task to bring the princess back, and the monsters that she took along with her were all annihilated. Beyond that, dragging a dragon into the battlefield was a grave sin. He got confused that a dragon was in a fight between humans and demons. Vale explained that she sent the demon back where she belonged. After that, Astra's title as one of the four heavenly kings was revoked, and she was exiled from the demon country. The girls were sure that they decided in a hurry without the demon king so that Astra's would fall into that dilemma, and were sure that this was all because of Sir Ravian. Astra's didn't agree with the girls because in the demon king's army, strength was everything and since she couldn't fulfill her task, she was in the wrong. He understood that the reason why she got fired was the uproar the other day but wondered if there was another reason because the girls were all crying. Vale asked what she wanted to talk to him about and Platy warned her to not tell her to take responsibility. She timidly told them that she needed to start a new life and she needed to know something to do. She was shocked by the goblins and orcs power against her army, 
and was even more surprised to see the two world-class calamities following him. She wanted to know what was special about him and begged him to let her work under him for a while. Platy and Vale were shocked, but he immediately accepted. He wasn't sure if working there would convince her, but trying to discover herself and putting herself out like that impressed him and he would like to help her. Vale told him that they might come to kill him again if he helped her, but he didn't seem bothered. The other girls asked if they could also stay, and he accepted. In exchange, while the three of them were there, bloodshed was prohibited. She stated that she would obey him as long as she was there and would take on anything, even any indignity, so he could ask anything of her. As she said it like that, he wanted to make a request now. While the girls were fighting to help her, the request he was asking was fieldwork. At first he wanted to give them household chores but he changed his mind. She didn't mind that because her skills were also specialized in that. However, the girl said that she was just hitting the same spot over and over again. She explained that that was called a hoe, which was used to dig into the soil and make ridges to plant seeds. Kidan commented that she was well informed, and she said she was a commoner so she had some experience. One of the girls mentioned that Astress and Palbalena were born as aristocrats in the demon country and were fair maidens. She told Batie the girl to leave that matter to her since she decided to serve the holy saint no matter what. Kidan thought how earnest the demons were. He told Bati to go and make ridges with the goblins. Meanwhile, Astris and Belena would plant the seed in those ridges with a 30 cm gap between each. They started to get back into the work, but not so long later, Astra's back started to feel terrible. Suddenly, Belena screamed. She was scared of something beneath the soil that was a wriggly, wriggling living thing. Astris made a sudden movement and cracked her back, and a huge mess happened, which is when Kidan realized that this job was impossible for them. He then sent them to their next job hunting with the orcs and goblins. That job was the right one for a warrior like her, she thought. She asked Platy what she was hunting and she said Kidan wanted to refill the meat stock so they were hunting square boars. They heard something and Astris told them to leave that to her and she would use that to rid herself of the shame from the field. The boars were getting closer and she told Belina and Betami to get ready. However, orcs and goblins were so strong and combined that they couldn't lift a finger. Astris noticed the axes and sickles they were holding and those were made from mana metals. Seeing the girls surprised, Platy explained that their tools and weapons were all made from mana metal. On top of that, the sheer metal purity of them was rare. Belina now understood how they were so strong, but those guys were unparalleled when Astris first met them. However, that time, they didn't have any weapons at all. Platy mentioned that the hoe from earlier was made from mana metal as well, which made her notice that it was their ability that was lacking, not the weapons. She didn't want to stand there doing nothing, so she ordered the girls to take them down. After a while, everyone but them managed to hunt square boars. She never thought taking the strength of the square boar into account and hunting in the mountains would be so hard. Platy got ready to dress them since they can't carry them like that. Meanwhile, Kidan was cooking a delicious meal for them and they arrived right on time. When he went outside to welcome them, he saw the gloomy mood the girls were in and wondered what was wrong. Platy explained that they were upset because things didn't go as they planned. Astra said that as one of the Demon King's four heavenly kings, Asters of Deception, she was a soldier who was feared by both human and mermaid races but upon coming there, she lost the title. The residents were unparalleled and the equipment was godly. What she realized was her powerlessness. Kidan told her that she wasn't powerless and it was not about their power, it was about the people who swore to stay by their side. And she had a power called charm. It was fine to believe in yourself more and someday she would discover new possibilities in herself. It appeared that he had successfully gathered them, so he proceeded to invite everyone to partake in their dinner. Given the pleasant weather, they made the choice to dine outdoors. The young ladies had never encountered such a dish before, and he took the opportunity to explain that it was a freshly prepared ginger-grilled square boar, accompanied by a delectable tanjiru soup. The dish emitted a delightful aroma, prompting them to sample it. The taste was so exquisite that Astris found herself welling up with tears of joy. Platy and Vale too expressed their contentment with the meal, and Kidan couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction at having prepared something so delightful. He encouraged everyone to savor the food and uplift their spirits, assuring them that they would give their best effort once more on the following day. Astris came to Belina to say that she couldn't find Platy and Kidan anywhere. It seemed they were in the sea. They had some errand to run as Belina said. Meanwhile, Astris was done harvesting the requested vegetables but she asked if other things needed to be done. Belina told her to pull some weeds there and after that they would clean the house. While Vale was lying down on the floor said that if a person did not do work, they would die. Astris then asked how her situation would be in that case but the attitude she saw was nothing but humiliated by Vale saying lowly demon to her. Vale said to Astris that she was doing a so-called house watching. Belina thought it would be reassuring when that person came back right and decided to guard the house while Kadan was away. 
Kidan and Platy were at the shore, and Platy said she really needed to return to her mermaid form from time to time. Kidan asked her if she felt more at ease spending time in the sea than on land. However, for Platy, it was the same either way. After all, the land-dwelling medicine that she made was the best quality, as she said, and her lifestyle on the land was comfortable. Kidan thought what a considerate wife she was and asked her what she wanted to talk about. As Platy said at the place that they were in, there were sea monsters coming out from those parts. Cave dungeons, mountain dungeons, and of course there were also dungeons in the ocean. Kidan realized that field fertilizers, the disappearing herrings, and even starfish were monsters too. Some monsters were useful, but some were not. To Platy, beneath that ocean, there was a bad monster dwelling in it. Kidan wasn't happy to hear that because he didn't like the idea of meeting one of the top five monsters that he didn't want to meet. However, Platy told him that if it was going to be deer, then even that monster was just a piece of cake. He couldn't let Platy go alone there. Meanwhile, Platy created a water-breathing medicine and wanted Kidan to put it in his mouth and then, while chewing it, he could breathe underwater. She warned him not to swallow the medicine. Then they were ready to go. Kidan sometimes forgot that his wife Platy was a mermaid because she was always on the surface, but she really was a mermaid, and that beautiful princess was his wife. Then they noticed something with a hostile look approaching them. It was a rhiny eel. Platy said to Kidan that she was going to stop that thing's movements, so she would leave the rest to him. Then she fought as hard as she could and the monster started to burn. She told Kadan it was his time so he made the last move and the monster was killed by them. Their task there was done so they decided to go home immediately. On the road back home that seaweed couldn't even be used for magical herbs, it grew so fast that it was a nuisance. So Kadan asked Platy what she was going to do about that. He thought that seaweed was probably a wakame, which was a species of edible brown seaweed. Platy told him not to tell her that he was going to make a dish out of eel and seaweed. As soon as they arrived, Kidan made food and told her that it was a trial dish seasoned with salt and pepper and it was done. It was the isekai wakame soup he made from the eel stock. Platy tasted it and really found it delicious. Even a useless ingredient seemed to be a lie. The refined flavor and crispness when you bit that seaweed and that feeling was amazing for Platy. She said that her respect for him just skyrocketed. Kidan told Platy that there were others who were supporting him and he had realized that the blessing of having support was such luck. The other thing that Kidan realized was that he needed to make time for just the two of them because they were newlyweds. Therefore, he decided to come together and swim. Platy was happy with that and she said that she needed to make a water-breathing medicine that enabled him to talk underwater. Then she would leave the monsters to him. In the demon castle, Astris, one of the four demon lords' heavenly kings, was not only dismissed, but also evicted. However, the demon lord wasn't happy with that decision so he asked Reverian who permitted her dismissal. As Reverian said before, Astris made a huge blunder. The lord said to Reverian that was his plan to make Astris fall into that dilemma. He sheathed his sword and held it to his throat, saying that he was a traitor while he was begging for forgiveness. Lord warned him and told him to get himself together by the time he returned, at least to a degree where he alone could shoulder the responsibility. Then Reverian gave him the coordinates of the transmitted magic. The demon lord set off furiously to find Kadan. He said that even demon lords had moments that were driven by passion. In the next scene, a girl named Momoko Akisaka was fighting with monsters as a hero. She was shouting out her attacks like she was in an anime. The goddess's sickle skill was the power she gained when she was transported to that world. She was using that power to fight alongside the humans who were in a war with demons. She was having a hard time adjusting to the new world she was in as there was no modern technology there. Food was cooked over a fire, bread was usually stale and hard, the bed had fleas and the clothing was made from rough fabrics that made her skin itch. As a result, some people from other worlds didn't last very long. When she was first summoned there, there were about nine others as well for a total of ten people. She wondered if the guy who had no skills was still around. In that harsh world, if you don't have any skills, you will most likely die. But she wasn't like him. Her skill was considered valuable, and it was the reason why the king was taking care of all her needs. Having a skill gifted by a good was considered a rare privilege. Now in that world, her main aim was to fight and fight until her skill is the strongest in the world. But the enemy kept on coming and the Demon King's army seemed to be made of endless numbers of troops, but she couldn't let anything end like that. They would protect that world as heroes. Suddenly, Vale appeared in her dragon form and scared everyone. Both humans and demons wondered why that deadly dragon was on the battlefield. Even with her special skill as a hero, wouldn't even come close to scratching that dragon's scales. The humans told everyone to retreat as they would be wiped out by the dragon's single breath. The dragon talked, saying that she came there to bring a message to all the lower tribes. She was the great dragon ruler, the daughter of the Grazer dragon, Grinnell Dragonvale. For today she was merely on an errand for her lord and simply returning that rude one. Astris. The demons noticed her and immediately went to catch her. Vale explained that she would have ended her and be done with it so they should be thankful to her lord for not allowing it. She then told them that if they bothered her lord again in any way, 
she would obliterate the city of Kisima and any others with a single breath. As proof of her power, she blew into the sky and showed them her power. Before she left, she mentioned that her lord was the great Saint Kidan, and to become his enemy meant becoming her as well. Everyone was shocked that there was someone who was higher than that dragon and no one had ever heard of that person before. Meanwhile, today, Kidan was eating his breakfast happily. Just like yesterday, he would do his best working in the field. Suddenly, the demon lord Zidane came to ask if he was the great Saint Kidan. Before he could say anything, Thing, the girls came to inform him that Astris had completed her first successful hunt. Then they noticed Lord Zidane. Lord Zidane was surprised to see her in there. She asked why he was there but he ignored her question. The Lord wondered why she left her forces without a word as his best officer. The atmosphere was really tense and she admitted that she failed in the mission to procure the mermaid princess. Furthermore, she was publicly humiliated by the dragon. A subordinate who could not fulfill her duties was of no use to the Lord Zidane as she said. The Lord Zidane wouldn't let her go as he always needed her to be by his side which made everything more interesting. They went inside and talked while drinking their tea. Kidan apologized for his speaking as that was the first time he was talking to an actual lord. As the demon lord it was his duty to lead the demon nations in their never-ending war with the human kingdoms. It was the duty of each demon lord to continue their war with the human nations. Kidan felt bad for him because he didn't have anything to look forward like a family at home. The constant battle could be tiring at times which was why he was grateful for Astra's assistant. She was the most reliable, extremely loyal, and indispensable. Astra's didn't think she deserved such kind of praise. Kidan asked if he could just give Astra's a pardon or reinstate her as he wasn't the one who exiled her in the first place. The Lord wished that it was that simple. Astra's was placed under military tribunal and she was sentenced to be exiled for her failure. He was at the front lines leading their forces so he couldn't come to defend her case. This was all done without his knowledge or permission, and there were several nobles who would profit and advance their positions with Astra's dismissal. Currently, they blame Astra's for angering the fearsome dragon that appeared on the front lines and threatened to wipe them out. The demon nations were in turmoil over that incident, and he couldn't spare the time to go back and calm them down. When he returned, Astra's was already gone so he went out to search for her. The Lord Zedan held her hands and told her to not leave him like that again. Plady noticed the obvious thing going on between them and asked if she really liked the Demon Lord. She tried to deny it and told them that they had been only friends since childhood, but no one seemed to buy that story. Vale told everyone to just stop talking and turn to the Demon Lord. She told him to plow the big boobed friend of his if he really wanted to, since he was the Demon Lord who could do anything he wanted. The Demon Lord was surprised by the bold words of a child like her. And Astris explained that she wasn't a child, she was the daughter of the Grazer Dragon and one of the two calamities of that world which was the dragon that came into the battle and threatened them. She explained that she wanted to incinerate her on the spot, but she went through all that trouble to return her to him. Kidan mentioned that they would be talking about that incident later. To think that Astris was in the company of some very unusual people would be an understatement. He could see that she was greatly indebted to him and owed her life. However, it was imperative that he took her back home with him. Therefore, he challenged him to a duel. Kidan tried to tell him that that wasn't necessary at all. As for Plady, nothing wouldn't matter anyway because not only her darling Kidan, the master of Grinzel Dragonvale, but also the other calamity as well, the undead king. The Lord was shocked to hear that. Kidan stated that Astris didn't belong to him or anyone else, so if she wanted, she could go back with the Lord. When she first came there, she was lost and didn't know what to do. She wanted to find her potential and place in the world. And after hearing Lord Zedan, he thought her place was being beside the Lord and he thought she could achieve her potential and be true to herself by his side as well. He advised her to be honest with him as he was with her. She made up her mind and swore that she would always stay by his side even in the battlefield or the afterlife. The girls were so happy that the injustice of the four kings was finally undone. Plady stood up and interrupted them. She stated that the Lord's outlook was far too naive, especially since the other demon nobles expect him to be her husband. The Lord didn't even know who she was so she introduced herself. She then informed him that the demon nobility had sent a petition to her father for an alliance to marry them. However, the Lord didn't even know anything about that. He swore to Astras that he had no idea about that and told her to not misunderstand. When Kadan thought about it, it did make sense to him. Of course, marrying her to the demon lord wasn't an option since her husband was Kidan. However, there seemed to be someone who wanted to undermine his authority. Removing Astris from the Four Kings would certainly shift the balance of power, especially since she was his most trusted subordinate. So she asked him to tell her who he thought had the most advancement with Astris's dismissal. There was only one person in everyone's mind. Plady continued to explain that that guy was behind every order. The demon was frustrated that even if he took her to the demon nations now, he would remind everyone what she did which would cause the demon nobility to lose faith and see him as a weakling. At best, he would lose a lot of loyal subjects. 
At worst, they would demand that his abdicate his throne, clearing the way for that usurper to take over. Kidan wondered if there was anything they could do. She said that the marriage was not only to forge an alliance, but to ensure that the kingdoms would have heirs. By not marrying the mermaid princess, he would be seen as ignoring the future of his nation. Platy stated that there was an easy way to solve all of that and foil that bastard's plan. The two of them didn't return to the demon notions as lord and subordinate, but as husband and wife, so they should get married. It was so sudden for Lord Zedon, but he had no problem with getting married to Asteris. Making her queen would be the worst thing that could happen to someone who wants Asteris's downfall. If someone in the demon race was aiming to have power as close as possible to the demon kings, then they would want their daughter or sister to be the king's first lady. With that, it settled that they were going to get married. Asteris didn't know what they were supposed to do to get married. Plady explained that what was needed in a marriage was exchanging marriage vows before God. They didn't seem to understand that, so she explained that it meant standing before God while saying their vows, and not even destiny could stand in the way of that. In Kadan's world, they would have to fill out a marriage registration form, submit it to the office and get married formally. He wondered how they do those marriage vows. Plady wanted to explain it so she called the lifeless king. Lord Zedon was taken aback when he saw him. He now knew that the rumors were true. Plady asked why she called the king. She explained that she had him to be their marriage. The lifeless king used to be a great pastor for a big church. She would have God see those to exchange their vows of love to each other with his own eyes. However, the lifeless king stated that they were from the demon race and back when he was alive, he used to serve the human race. Plady wasn't expecting that. She felt bad for not thinking about everything. Kidan didn't seem to understand what was wrong, so the king explained that different races worship different gods. The human race worships the god of the heavens, Zeus. The mermaid race, position, and the demon race, the god of the underworld, Hades. Each believed in their own respective gods. While Plady was upset, the lifeless king said he would see what he could do. When he lived for at least a thousand years, he acquired a lot of knowledge. Though the tenets may be different, he would study the etiquettes of the prayer. Plady asked if the Lord and Astras were okay with that and they didn't have any problem. The king gave it a try and started the marriage process. They felt a heavy atmosphere weighing on the earth's surface. Something started to form and there it was. The god of the underworld Hades. The lifeless king seemed to summon the god accidentally. He intended to offer a prayer and create a holy ground in order to perform the wedding ceremony. Hades talked, saying that this hadn't happened in a long time. He asked what was his purpose to summon him there and if the human race finally waged an Armageddon. The Lord kneeled and explained that the conflict with the human race continues to be in a state of ebb and flow. It was a situation where he couldn't let his guard down however it was nothing he needed to concern himself with. Hades repeated his question and told him to introduce himself. He did and said that on the occasion, he had asked for a woman's hand in marriage. In line with that, they conducted a wedding ceremony and wished to be granted God's blessings. However, they ended up calling him by mistake. He apologized for disturbing him. Hades seemed to be fine with it. However, he stated that if he was going to grant his blessing, his wife needed to be his one and only. He asked if he could swear that he would love that woman for the rest of his life. That was actually all he wanted. He wanted to be paired with Astris for the rest of his life and not with any other woman. Hades let them receive God's blessings and disappeared. Gods were surprisingly good beings as Kadan thought. Vale found him loud while Lifeless King promised to be careful with prayer ceremonies next time. On top of everything, having received blessings directly from a god himself gave the two of them divine protection. It seemed that whoever tried to forcibly sabotage their relationship would be met with divine punishment. That has become the ultimate proof of love that the Lord could show to his demon brethren. The Lord thanked Kadan for making it possible for his dream of marrying Astris to come true. Astris mentioned that they would never forget that kindness for the rest of their life. Kidan didn't want to take all the credit and told them that he was happy for Astris. The Lord turned to Astris and asked if they should go now to introduce her as the Demon Queen. However, unexpectedly, Astris refused to go and told him that she was thinking of staying there for a little longer. Vale was not happy about her decision and told her to go home since they married each other already. The Lord asked the reason and she stated that she wanted to retrain herself as his wife. He was surprised but respected her decision. He then asked if Kadan could look after her a little longer. That wasn't a problem for him but he didn't even know how he was supposed to be any help. He felt guilty especially since the newlywed was going to be separate. Separated. Then, the Lord asked if he would mind if he also stayed there for a while. He was shocked and asked if it would be trouble for his people if he wasn't present, but it should be fine for a short time. Thanks to the dragon that came flying on the battlefield, both factions were still shaken. Until both sides had obtained information, no troops would be dispatched. Vale seemed to be regretting her decisions. Since there was no problem for them, Kadan was okay with welcoming them for a while. He even started thinking about building another house for them. Vale interrupted and told the Lord that their staying there meant there was no one in his camp executing the plot. 
If he left things as it was and let his center be exposed, the other party would think about plotting something evil, but the Lord took everything into account when he made his decision. Vale still wasn't convinced. She also found it weird that he came there without having any ship. The Lord explained that he used teleportation magic. If he set up a teleportation point beforehand, he could teleport in an instant. Astra's subordinate Belena left him a memo with the coordinates of that place. Belina explained that the thought of them being separated because of some suspicious plot frustrated her. They thanked Belina. Platy interrupted, wondering that since several demons could use teleportation magic, was there a possibility that they would come after him there? He told her to not worry about it. The coordinates to access that place were encrypted, and unless the person who made the encryption tells it, then identifying it was practically impossible. Moreover, that place was being blocked from recognition. The demon race uses teleportation or clairvoyance magic in that age. Either magic allowed the user to identify a place far away from them, but a powerful restriction magic that voids them surrounded that entire area. It was all or nothing when the Lord tried teleporting, but thanks to Belina, he managed to arrive there. They were far from being able to come there or even sense him being there. Kidan wondered who put up such a convenient magic barrier, and the lifeless king said that only a dragon could use such magic. Vale didn't see any point in hiding it, so she confessed that she put up a barrier around the entire area to stop the demons from coming there, but he still managed to come there. Kadan kneeled to her and asked if she really thinking of him that much. Vale approved him saying that she wanted to eat her hot master's meal all to herself. They now understood that it wasn't because she hated them. He patted her head and thanked her for always looking after him. Now it was the time to celebrate the marriage. Kidan prepared a huge fest to congratulate them on their marriage. When the Lord tasted it, he stated that he had never eaten something that delicious. Vale loved the food so much that she turned it into her real form. Since the Lord's astonishment was continuing, he explained that it was the same meat Mrs. Astris caught for them today, the Kirasaki deer. Platy prepared it well by using magic seasoning. It wasn't just him, it was made by everyone. Vale told them that all of them were meant to serve her master and her. He mentioned that Vale also thought about them in many ways. Platy was amazed by the taste of the food. The Lord said that it was something that you couldn't even find in the royal palaces. He seemed to understand why the dragon wanted to conceal that place. Platy wondered how he learned to cook like that. He explained that he used to live alone so he did a little bit of cooking for himself. Thanks to the skill he had endowed with, he was able to recreate ingredients and cuisine not native to that world. But he thinks that was why it tasted delicious. At any rate, he was just happy they were enjoying it. Astris wondered if Kidan's cooking was a state secret. She suddenly kneeled to him and asked if he could teach her the ways of a newlywed bride. Platy scolded her for asking someone else's husband for that. She felt upset that other than swinging hand chops, there was not much she could do. He tried to cheer her up by saying it was because of her that the crops he grew and the dishes he made tasted good. However, she was a queen now, so it would be for the best if someone like Koku looked after her. She doesn't agree because she thinks it is necessary for her to overcome as the demon Lord Zidane's dutiful wife. The Lord asked him to train him as well. He didn't understand his request and asked if he wanted to undergo bridal training. He approved him, and not only the cuisine but also the crops to the building themselves were truly interesting. He could understand why his wife wanted to study there. Also, he wanted to reciprocate Astris's desire to support him as her husband. He thought a married couple should support each other just like Kidan does. Platy bragged about him not being the same as other kings who just sit pretty in their castles. They were counting on Kidan in that case. The next days continued with making constructions and teaching the Lord Zidane. Not surprisingly, he was good with his hand. Astris came there to inform them that the food was ready, wearing a cute apron. The Lord blushed seeing her that cute and thought he was in heaven. They sat and started to eat. The meal was delicious as always. The demon king was crying from happiness. He wondered what was the name of the dish and Astris said it called Nikujaga. Kidan mentioned that she made the meal herself and was pretty good at handling a kitchen knife. All that was left was to learn the process and different traits of ingredients and seasoning. The girl wondered what else was necessary for bridal training and Balana mentioned the clothing. Learning to sew was also important. She noticed the clothes the Lord wearing and Kidan explained that he made it himself. He was a guy so he could also make clothes for other guys but even though he promised to make clothes for Platy, he couldn't come up with a design, but he already had some fabric with him. He showed the fabrics and Belina was shocked about their quality of them. When he was exploring the mountain dungeon earlier, he found a caterpillar that spewed thread, so as an experiment he tried to bring back several of them to raise himself, and that is how he was able to make that fabric from the caterpillars. They were again realized his unique ideas. That means that it was okay to make clothes for girls using fabric. Belena's parents actually used to run a needlework shop so she knew all sorts of things. Kidan told them to start with making Platy's clothes first. 
Bateme took out her measurements and it was now time to find out her three measurements. She told everyone to let her measure them since she would be making everyone else's clothes eventually. Platy wondered if she would make everyone strip and take off his pants. The girls were shocked and asked her if she had always gone commando. Platy didn't know the meaning of commando and wondered why people had the same reaction every time she stripped. The girls remembered that since she was a mermaid she didn't have the concept of wearing clothes for her lower half. Platy wondered if there was any problem and Bateme explained that to them demons and humans living there on the surface, exposing the lower half to the public was considered a crime. Platy was shocked by that information and got mad that no one had ever said that to her. She remembered that her brother was putting something on his body sometimes which was called panties. Bedemy told her to leave it to her and she would show her wonderfully made panties. While measuring Platy, Bedemy noticed that she was tucking her stomach in. Platy never felt upset about the delicious food Kidan made until that moment. They measured Astris too, and her stomach was more plumper than they had imagined. After a while, Bedemy finished making Platy's skirt. The frills on her dress were inspired by the sea's waves and it was blue. Platy seemed to love her skirt and Kadan was thankful to Bedemy. While they were talking about the panties Bedemy made, Vale threw a fireball toward Platy's skirt. Kadan was about to scold her but she told him to keep quiet and take a look. As Vale thought, it didn't burn at all which means that fabric had a great deal of anti-magic infused into it. She was almost sure that it also had high defensive powers which would make it superior to armor. Bedemy didn't do anything different to the fabric so they wondered if the caterpillar had an ability like that. Vale asked if Kadan had done something to them. He said that he only treated them with care while hoping to make good clothes for Platy. Vale now understood what happened. Orcs and goblins got enhanced after meeting him and the same thing probably happened to those caterpillars. Vale wanted Bedemy to make her an armor too, but she was complaining that it wasn't an armor it was fashion. Since the Demon King's clothes were originally cotton meant for futons, they would also have Bateme remake it for them. Astris noticed that his clothes were a little torn over. She told him that she would fix it and he thanked her. He took off his shirt and Astris started to sew his shirt. Kidan was watching them and decided to let the king have the shit for a bit longer. Meanwhile in the human kingdom the king was thinking about the dragon veil. Because of her the war was at a stalemate. He was brainstorming how they were supposed to proceed now. One of the king's men came and informed him that according to the generals at the front line the reason the dragon showed up had yet to be identified. Thus the army advised not to mode. The king considered them as a bunch of cowards. He asked about the information on the master that the dragon was obeying but there wasn't any new information about that. The king was whining about how everyone was so useless and ordered another cup of squeezed fish juice which was so stinky. The king, Junisus the 18th, was supposed to put an end to the war that had been going on for centuries with an overwhelming impending victory for the human. They used up all the country's mana to summon heroes from a parallel world. The main goal was to defeat the demon race and thoroughly exploit them for their country but with the dragon they couldn't move forward on that purpose. When his man brought his drink, he asked if he thought the master of the dragon existed in the first place. The men stated that everyone was doubtful about that. However, if they make a wrong move, they provoke it. And if the dragon ever appears again, destruction would be inevitable. This sentence brought something to his mind. He ordered him to find Saint Kidan. If they had him as one of their subjects, their victory would be certain. That was true, but the man wasn't sure how they would find him. He told him to form a search party made up of capable heroes. Junisus temporarily disbanded the army and ordered them to devote all their resources to finding Kidan. He was confident to find him and claim the human race's victory. Meanwhile, at the Kidan's place, Zidane and Astris were drinking tea. It had been two months since they came there and they were able to learn so many things. The time they would be leaving was getting closer but Zidane wanted to get back the feeling of a sword again. When he grabbed the sword he paused for a second. Astris asked what was wrong. He said that with just one swing the holy sword Ainlot felt agitated like it was resonating with something. They went outside to inform Kadan and Zidane noticed the sword he was holding. Kadan was talking about how useful the sword was and how he used it to cut the mana metal just now. Platy came and explained that the sword was a holy sword they picked up from the undead king's dungeon. Zedan would have never thought he would have the legendary evil sword Dreischwartz. Apparently he was planning to give it back to the lifeless king, but the sword wouldn't leave him. Platy mentioned the time he defeated the undead king to protect her. He tried to explain that they had no other choice back then, and he didn't even know the power gifted to him by the gods. According to the legend Zedan knew, a saint's power could even surpass that of a hero's which was the same thing the undead king said to Kadan. Zidane asked if he was one of the heroes summoned by the human king from a parallel world. He approved him and explained that even though he had been summoned there, he had no useful battle skills which is why he was dismissed from the war and started his life in that land, far away from the human race. Astris felt sorry for him but he showed them what he could do with the soil and explained that his skill was pretty useful for a peaceful lifestyle. 
It was indeed wonderful, but still didn't fit for the battles. However, Zidane was still having a hard time understanding how he was superior even to the undead king. He explained that his skill gave him the ability to bring out the maximum potential of anything he touched, but that didn't mean he was strong himself. Zidane disagreed with him. There wasn't a single being in that world who could withstand his power. He asked if it was possible for him to prove his superiority over the human race and return to their kingdom, but Kadan didn't plan on doing that. Even though it sounded rude, he stated that he was not affiliated with anyone and it was because he didn't belong to anyone. This is also how he was able to marry Plati. Zidane stated that if he hadn't been there things would have gotten more serious between humans and demons, since mermaids would get involved in their strife as well. Zidan certainly believed that his existence was of great significance to that world, and hoped for everything to go well. It was now about time for Zidane and Astris to go back to their country. His plan was to return and mow down those who were imprudent as well as regaining the sympathy of the entire nation once more. Kadan hyped him up while Vale was complaining as always. She asked why the girls weren't going home. Belina explained that as long as she was there the Demon King could come to that place whenever he wished. She would make sure to carry out the role of connecting the Demon King to that land at all costs, and Betami wanted to continue making clothes there. Additionally as a gift, she gave Astra's a dress that the Demon King would fall in love with. She seemed to love the dress and thanked Betami for her efforts. They got ready to leave and everyone wished good luck to them. While they were going Zidane mentioned that he always thought he would never be able to resolve the war between the demon and human races peacefully. However, Kidan's existence made him realize that what he gave up on wasn't a mere dream. He asked Astris if she would lend him her power for that dream of his and she was happy to help him. In the next scene, Kidan finished making bread. Everyone seemed to love the taste of it. He mentioned that it was one of the staple foods back in his world. They could also use wheat flour to make stuff other than bread. That was another addition to his repertoire. He then told the girls that there was a crop he had been thinking of producing next. He was planning to make the real staple food of his world so he wanted to produce rice. However, Platy seemed to have something to say. She said that the orc team was in charge of construction while the goblin team handled the field work. Betami was their tailor and Belina controlled the waypoints. Vale was claiming that she was protecting the land and Platy was the only one who was in charge of medicine and fermenting, preparing and processing the field's manure, producing miso and soy sauce at the brewery, and last but not least, she was managing the fridge and the crop warehouse. She can't possibly handle all that workload by herself. Kadan felt incredibly guilty and threw himself at her to apologize. There were so many things he wanted to do and he totally forgot about the workload she already had. While they were talking, Platy's brother came and asked what was the meaning of all that commotion. Kadan apologized to him for being a failure as a husband, which he wasn't expecting at all. Platy asked why he was there. He said that after negotiating with the saint the other day they agreed to sell the pickled radishes being produced here with him so he came to buy them. Platy scolded him for ordering in bulk lately. It was also their neighbor's lifeless king's favorite. Platy was thinking about how her field had a terrible lack of people when an idea appeared in her mind. She told her brother that the people who would balance out her workload were the merfolk who specialize in pharmaceutical magic and asked him to bring several people from the mermaid kingdom. Otherwise she would decrease the production rate of the pickled radishes. She asked for Kidan's opinion before the prince could say anything. Kidan was okay with it if the prince was okay too. Platy tried to convince her brother because she wanted to feed rice to her dear husband. The prince asked Kidan if he was aware of what the shore meant to them merfolk. Kidan thought they hated it at first but Platy eventually came to appreciate it. The prince explained that Platy was a weirdo. Any normal mermaid would perceive the shore as a hellish place. Merfolk couldn't survive on shore in the first place. In other words, Platy who decided to settle there of her own free will was a tremendously rare case. It was also thanks to her new medicine that he could traverse between land and water freely, but before then, it was but a crude concoction. There were restrictions to turning into a land dweller. Side effects included losing your voice, turning into bubbles, and vanishing. Vale didn't understand why there were so many downfalls of that so she told him to stay in the water, but that was not possible. The concoction served as an important resource used for things like diplomacy. Regardless of whether a perfect medicine was made or not, most merfolk wouldn't come on land. Also, ever since the completion of that new medicine, a new system had been implemented in their kingdom which was the banishment of criminals. Aside from the death penalty as a form of severe punishment, it had been decided that banishment to the surface would be another alternative. Without the vaccine to reverse the medicine's effects, they had no choice but to spend the rest of their lives in a vast and unknown land. They all seemed horrified by the things he had just said. Platy didn't care about what he said and told him to do something about it as the Mermaid Kingdom's prince. The prince thought about it for a moment and said that when it comes to Platy's helpers, they must be at a certain level of potion brewing. However, even if they used the Royal Palace's human affairs team, dispatching them to the surface for a long period of time would be difficult. Platy had an idea. She suggested bringing those banished criminals there instead. That was not what they were expecting. 
he scolded her for saying something so careless. But Kidan didn't mind that either, but he wouldn't want to expose Plati to danger. Vale got angry again and said that she would just burn anyone who came there. And the prince liked the idea of that. It was actually a good idea since under those circumstances even the criminals would have no other choice but to give in. She told her brother to bring three criminals if he wanted to eat his pickled radishes. She didn't care if they were criminals or not as long as they were capable. In fact criminals would be better since she wanted to slave them to death. After a while the princes brought three girls with no panties. Vale thought since they were all criminals it was fine. Bedemy expected that to happen so she brought them something to wear. The prince introduced the girls one by one. The first one was Puffer, the one at the center was Lampi, and the last one was Gararufa. Even though they were all girls, he warned Kidan to not let his guard down. Kidan thanked them for coming there and introduced himself. The girls were a little reluctant. Plady came and told them to prepare themselves. The girls were shocked to see her. The prince informed the three girls that they would serve their sentence by working under his sister Princess Platy. Lampi was happy to see her so she tried to hug her but she failed. She was so happy to serve her one more time in her life. While she was crying Platy told her to keep it quiet. Vale wasn't sure if she was really a criminal. The prince said that they were famous criminals in their country. Puffer complained about Lampi being a suckerfish to the royal family, but Rufa could say the same thing about her. Puffer tried to defend herself by saying that Rufa only followed them because she liked Prince Aravana. Lampi promised to be by the royal highness's side until her last breath. Platy wondered where this idea came from in her mind. Meanwhile, Kidan asked the prince what those ladies' crimes were. In their kingdom, six ferocious witches specializing in pharmaceutics called the Great Mad Witches exist, and today, he brought the three of them with him. Puffer was focusing on globally circulating the mana flow under the seas. She aims to develop a way to artificially control that. Kidan couldn't understand what was wrong with that. He explained that if she could control mana, she would engulf the entire world in ice. And with that, she planned for the ruin of both the human and the demon races. Gara Rufa was entrusted to the highest authority in the Merfolk Medical Association for Pharmaceutical Magic, but she spouted peculiar theories. She was complaining about how no one understood her work. Within illnesses lie microscopic beings that were behind their cause, she said. She said that the human body could remember foreign pathogens that enter the system and build resistance against them. Then, antibodies could be produced by drawing blood from those who had recovered from the disease and injecting into the body of another affected person. Aravana couldn't believe she still dared think of treating a weakened patient patient like that, even though one can die from being injected with someone else's blood into their veins. However, an otherworlder like him would understand everything she said. He then asked about Lampi's crime. According to the prince, she was even more troubled. She used to serve the royal merfolk as an imperial guard. He didn't understand why someone like her would be in jail. The prince explained that the riot during Platy's wedding was the cause. The merfolk, who were compelled to politically marry into either the human or demon race, had their public opinion split into two at that time, not knowing whom to side. But there appeared a merman noble who spoke to his father and objected to Platy's marriage from a neutral standpoint. It was hard to overlook the risks of a failed marriage if you stall for time. He was sure the other party would eventually back down. However, he also had quite a loose tongue. He told to the people that Princess Platy was just some drug freak with no sense of decorum and so on. And Lampi, enraged upon hearing that, brutally beat that very same aristocrat. She told the prince that she wasn't the one who was wrong. It was actually that aristocrat who insulted Platy. The prince apologized that they were like that. Kidan asked if Platy was happy that he was worried about her. The prince mentioned that there was something else he didn't tell him about Platy. The truth was, she was also one of the great mad witches. Kidan was taken aback and wanted to know what did she do. The prince explained that compared to the other witches, Platy had been behind far more dangerous drug inventions and scandals by a long shot. Since she was from the royal family, she didn't get punished for her actions. She even called the crowned witch. Because of her reputation, his brother was counting on Platy. There was no one else but her who could command those witches. The girls were happy to serve her but they wondered where exactly that place was. They could understand that the man named Kadan was the owner. In that case, they thought the place was under the human race but their tailor was a demon and there were even goblins and orcs. Vale interrupted saying that none of that should matter to them and they should just work their hardest to produce good food while they were there. The girls commented that she was a remarkably arrogant individual. Hearing that, Vale transformed into her real form and scared the hell out of them. While they were trying to figure out how a dragon was there, Rufa fainted. Kidan told her to behave or else he wouldn't give her any food. She immediately came back to her real form and Kidan suggested throwing a pizza party to welcome their three new friends. The girls were confused if he was a cook or a dragon owner. Platy came and stated that he was her husband and now it was Lampi's turn to faint. Suddenly the lifeless king appeared and thanked him for the invitation. Seeing the world's two greatest calamities being there it was now Puffer's turn to faint. After a while three of them woke up trying to figure out where they were. The house they were in was so big and there was a fragrant scent in the air. 
While they were recalling the things they remember, Belina came and introduced herself. She then informed me that Saint Kadan called for them. Hearing Kadan's name made Lampi remember the last things that happened and she immediately ran to Platy to cry about her marriage with a demon. Platy told her that there wasn't any hell, and that her husband was a human. This made her even more disappointed and mad. The other girls were confused that the owner of that land that was in the demon race's territory was actually human. Belena explained that this wasn't under the demon race's sphere of influence and it was hard to explain what that place exactly was. Rufa claimed that the place was probably a complete solitary zone. Platy approved her and said that St. Cadan's reclaimed land. However, that was impossible for the girls. Lampi wondered what would happen if there was a dispute between the human or demon races. Vale stated that they could just burn them. She remembered that she was the Grinzel Dragon Vale and was sure that the lifeless king was also there, which he was. Belina knew that it was scary to see them together as she reacted the same but the two of them protect them in that place. Vale told them that all they would do was work to serve her meals. Puffer wasn't feeling good about being a cook while Lampi was tearing up again to see Platy doing slave work. She ignored them and decided to show them around before they ate. Firstly, she showed them the place they would be working from now on. They were shocked by the strange odor that wasn't really unpleasant. Platy explained that that was where she processed food and prepared condiments. Since the girls were foreign about everything, she had them try a soy sauce. When they tasted it, they were astonished by the taste of it. Lampi praised Platy for being amazing but the idea wasn't her to be more precise. When she explained the details of it, Rufa was impressed by everything since her research was also in the same field. She tried to drink it all by one sip but Platy stopped her saying that she would die. Puffer and Lampi wondered who that saint guy was since he didn't seem to be just anybody. Platy explained that he was summoned from another world as a hero to help humans defeat the demon race. That seemed cruel to the girls. She continued to explain that when the king called them as he pleased, they noticed that he had no skill that could be useful for the battle, so he was driven out. Vale interrupted them saying that she was starving to death. When they got back home, the pizza was done cooking. Kidan cut them into slices while apologizing for keeping them waiting. The girls tasted the pizza and they were amazed. When Kidan asked them their opinions about the food, they stated that they were astonished. Kidan then served the pickled radishes the prince loved. Platy mentioned that she would be able to make more pickled radishes now so he could buy as much as he wanted. The prince said he would be coming there once a week which excited Puffer. While Platy was happily eating her meal, Lampi was watching her wonder how she was charmed by Kadan, but she seemed very ecstatic. At night the girls were talking about the food and Kadan. The comfort they were getting right now felt unreal so they thought that place could be a heaven. The next day, Puffer was done doing her job. Rufa asked if she could help her if she finished her work. Her work was to pickle the dried radish and add it to the barley miso. The contents of that barley miso rely on a microbe called mold. Hearing that grossed her out a little. However, that was how they could make pickled radishes which were the prince's favorites. While they were working, she asked where Lampi went and Rufa said that she went out with the orcs to hunt. Lampi was having a good time hunting the boars one by one. At night, Kadan and Platy were talking about how it was beneficial for them to have the three of them. Not only did they support Platy in her work, they also lent Orkubo and Gobukichi a hand, and they were able to finish making a paddy field quickly. They already had the seedlings with them so all that was left to plant them. Before he fell asleep, he mumbled that cultivating rice was something special to him. The next day, they started to plant the rice. The girl especially Puffer aren't pleased by today's job. She tried to come up with the excuse of clothes being dirty but Belina explained that those clothes were made for that job. Rufa mentioned that rice was a suitable ingredient for fermentation and they could even make wine from it. She mentioned that she was sure Prince Arowana would be pleased with it so Puffer was now looking forward to planting the rice. She told Platy that she wouldn't let her covered in mud but Platy said they were all doing it, including Vale. Platy then asked Kadan to show them the basic. He explained the steps one by one and they got started. It was indeed harder than they imagined. Bateme fell into the mud and Kadan helped her. She mentioned that she hadn't slept since she made those clothes. Vale was making fun of them for being weak. Even though she looked like a little girl, her strength was the same as it was. Platy was also in a good mood since having strong legs as a mermaid was a plus. Vale asked if she would like to bet on who plants faster and they started their little planting race. With their enthusiasm, they were already finished making one row. Platy ran out of seeds and requested some. Lampi brought her some and Vale bumped her intentionally to sabotage the race. Lampi was surprised that Vale was that strong even though she was in that form. But the princess's legs were certainly not normal. That must be the reason why she could do such hard labor, Lampi thought. But Platy said that it may be a factor, but it wasn't like she was doing it to train her body. Vale mentioned that it was all for the sake of eating good food and nothing else. Platy agreed with her. They then got back to work and planting the rice was done in a day thanks to everyone's help. With Platy's fish fertilizer and magic, the rice grew within a month 
and Kidan cooked the first rice in the world. Vale eagerly wanted to try some, but Platy said that Kidan should be the first one who tried it. Belina and Betami mentioned that Platy gave it her all just so it would grow faster. The use of fertilizer and maintenance of the field also played a part in that, but she also made the necessary preparations and appealed to them all to cooperate when planting. Kidan was impressed and felt grateful for everyone. Platy told him to try it already, and when he did, Kidan teared up a little, saying that it was tasty. Vale was shocked that the taste of the rice made him tear up. He told her that he would be preparing the side dish so she should wait. Platy asked Kadan why rice was so special to him and she explained that it was because he wanted to express his gratitude to the person who gave him that ability. He then thanked Platy for helping him out while thinking about Hephaestus. In the next scene, they were at the mountain and were saved by the lifeless king. Dealing with a large number would have been hectic for them. Lampi felt like she was going to lose her position as Imperial Guard. Platy asked if the dungeon changed but it was the same monster as before. Vale explained that there was nothing to worry about as the place they were at right now was untouched. It would be inconvenient if they lost all the monsters they had been eating up until now. After walking a while, they arrived at a clearing. Lampi informed that she was sensing some monsters nearby, and not so long later, something started to jump out from the dense grass around them. Kidan saw them and called them as UFOs as they were unidentified flying objects. Lampi told them to leave that to her, but Platy and Kadan told her to not underestimate them. Firstly, Lampi threw something to immobilize their movement. An explosion was created, and Platy remembered that she uses explosive magic potions, which is why she was called the Witch of Hellfire. However, when the smoke disappeared, there weren't even any scratches on the monsters. Vale mentioned that they were called Lotus, a tortoise type monster. The hardness of its shell was top notch even among monsters. But since it was a tortoise, she thought they could just flip it, but it immediately defended itself. Gobuchi came and aimed for its body, but when he hit it, his handle broke. Platy told Kadan that it was now his time to shine. With his one move, the lotuses were defeated. It looked like its tentacles were its weak point, which he never would have guessed. Vale congratulated them for beating the lotus, but they were the weakest among the monsters she had prepared. The strongest ones were waiting for them. Gobichi said that they could use that as a shield for the orcs and goblins. Platy didn't care about what Vale said and said that they came there to investigate things in the first place. Lampi was still worried, but Platy told him to not worry about it as her husband was the strongest in the whole world. Lampi states her surprise about how Kidan surpasses both the lifeless king and the dragon in terms of power. However, there was one thing she failed to comprehend. She didn't understand why the human kingdom banished him despite the power he possessed. He explained that he didn't have any skills fitting for battle. With that gift, he could bring out the maximum potential of anything he touches, and also because of the holy sword. That was why he didn't think he was someone amazing like they say. She didn't agree with him as his power was as dependable as it was. Lampi was happy that Platy married a man like him. Even if the human or demon races decided to invade, Princess Platy and the entire mermaid kingdom were safe. The sun was shining on top of them. Vale came and mentioned the next stage which was called Scorching Hell, and monsters that were at their best under such circumstances would attack them. When she finished her words, wolves appeared. Vale mentioned that they were the most dangerous monsters out there, the Hylicaeons. There was no way they could win against them in terms of stamina. When the wolves aimed Kadan, the girls panicked but they were actually being submissive. Vale was shocked. The lifeless king explained that the perceptive Hylicaeon seemed to have sensed his power. He started to pet their head and belly while Platy wondered what he was going to do about that. They continued their ways while the wolves were following them. The lifeless king said wolf-type monsters build a strict hierarchy among themselves to form a back and they must have recognized him as their leader, Lord Saint. Kadan never thought they would like him that much even without the influence of his gift. Lampi wondered if that meant that the dungeon was high level. Vale wanted to be praised more as there were even more dangerous monsters in the next stages. And then, the aid got colder and it started to snow. It was the final area of her dungeon, the freezing hell. Kadan wanted to go back home but when he turned his back there was a giant bear looking at him. It seemed that was the source of immense pressure Platy had been sensing ever since they came there. Platy wanted to leave that monster to the lifeless king, but Kidan wanted to avoid ruthless killing as much as possible. The lifeless king mentioned that he wouldn't be able to run from it. The monster was also aware of his strength and he was a warrior who only knew how to fight. The bear roared as he was about to attack but the wolves jumped on him. While the bear was distracted with the wolves, Lampi decided to prevent the bear from moving so she aimed for his legs. She injured a tendon in its foot so it shouldn't be able to move now. Taking that as a chance to go back down, they started to walk away from it, but Kadan told them to wait, and asked if Pletty still had that salve he told her to bring. Lampi wouldn't let him use it on the bear, as he would just vanish on his own if they left him be. Kidan still wanted to save him, as he must have his own subjectivity. Platy couldn't say no to him, so she gave the salve. He used it on the bear's foot, and they were ready to go now. However, Vale didn't want them to go like that, so she said that she was their last opponent. 
Lampi seemed scared, so she explained that it was just a clone who had one hundredth of her power. She was ready to fight, but before they could do anything the bear stood up and punched her clone like it was nothing. While wondering why he had done that, the bear was gone. Gobukichi explained that as monsters, they could understand what he felt and he was a prideful beast. The battle just now was his way of repaying Kadan's kindness. In that case, they would definitely see him again. Lampi was amazed by Kadan's kindness. They got back home and Vale seemed dissatisfied. When Platy asked what was wrong with her, Rufa explained that her new dungeon didn't excite them very much. The dinner was ready, and it was from their new menu, Katsudan. Kadan thanked her for making it possible to make the dish he had been wanting to make for a long time. This made her feel more satisfied with her dungeon. They gathered around and started to eat their dinner in peace. After dinner, Kadan was in her front yard, wondering how their settlement would develop from there on out. Little did he know that outside an unexpected group of humans had gathered, their eyes filled with astonishment at the village before them. They hurriedly informed their leader, who happened to be none other than Aileron, the notorious head of a gang of thieves. He decided he needed to witness this for himself. That is the end of the recap for now. Please read the pinned comment about the next part.